Let's talk about like Old Testament violence for a little bit, because I think for some people, maybe the first time uh, they read through the Old Testament, they may be a little bit surprised to see maybe God saying, go and take out these people or things like that. So wh when we look at like this idea of like God seemingly, you know, some people will go to the extreme of saying commanding something like maybe like genocide um, right. very far. Like, how do we look at this from like, does this would this make God like a moral monster? Like, how do we look at these passages in general? Right. There are uh, certainly challenging passages, and I don't want to diminish the reality of some of those challenges. But as I have, you know, the more I read, the more I see that there is more going on in, behind, in and behind these texts than a lot of people realize. Uh, as you keep reading some of those texts where it says, oh, those people were utterly destroyed, uh, well, it's actually not the, that that same that kind of scenario in an actual fact uh, that you have people who it says that they've been utterly destroyed that there were no survivors and then they appear sometimes a verse later they appear in the next chapter or a few chapters later and you know like I mentioned in uh, for example in uh, Judges chapter one mention of the Jebusites those who live in in Jerusalem uh, that they. Uh, that they were utterly destroyed, the city was burned, and so forth. A few verses later, those Jebusites, it says that they, the, they, they could not, the Benjamites could not drive them out. In fact, they are there till this day. Well, which is it? Well, if you understand that this is part of the genre of the ancient Near East, where you have, again, you see it in the literature of uh, the various war texts of the, uh, the Egyptians or the Assyrians and so forth, where they have language that says, we utterly destroyed them, we turned them to ash, there were no survivors and so forth. Uh, the history, the history uh, tells us otherwise, that you no, know, there are actually many survivors. For example, in uh, in Egypt, uh, the Ramses III said that he had destroyed the Philistine peoples, the sea peoples, uh, and that they were, they were basically as nothing. Well, that's the language of hyperbole. Yeah. But as it turns out, those Philistines, the sea peoples, actually ended up later colonizing the eastern part of Egypt. So even though Pharaoh said they were as nothing, we totally destroyed them, there is a significant, so it's kind of like a, a quagmire. He may have won a technical victory, but in the end, he lost a lot of troops, lost a lot of power. And then, uh, you know, in the next generation, those sea peoples ended up actually colonizing a portion of Eastern Egypt. So you see that kind of language over and over again. And as you read the scriptures, and I've talked about this with Matt Flanagan, my co-author, when we did our book, Did God Really Command Genocide? Putting in parallel passages that look like there are no survivors, and then we have in a parallel column that those same cities, those same events have lots of survivors that, that linger. And so I think it's best to understand that kind of language as referring to hyperbole, that there's a lot of exaggeration going on. Uh, in a recent book by John and Harvey Walton uh, on the lost world of the Israelite conquest, uh, they talk about this language of utterly destroy, you know, that uh, the, the term is haram, uh, utter, utterly destroy, or the term harem, uh, utter destruction. Uh, they, they argue that it's been mistranslated. Uh, you have the term that is applied, for example, at the end of Leviticus uh, in, in tw chapter 27, where you have a servant or an animal uh, or even a field that is cherem, that is, you know, you know, set apart. Uh, you know, and again, it's not as though the field is somehow burned or scorched uh, or the animal is killed or the person is who is pronounced haram is, uh, is killed. Uh, rather, there is a removal from ordinary use to uh, to a, a uh, kind of a sanctified use related to the temple, like serving uh, the Levites or the priests. Uh, so it's not as though that person is killed, that person is removed from ordinary use. And so the Waltons argue that this term has to do with identity removal. Mm -hmm. And they use the example of Nazi Germany, where they talk about how after the Second World War, the Allied powers uh, destroyed all of the symbols related to Nazism. They they tore down the monuments. They removed the hierarchical structure of Nazism. 
And yes, some who resisted were killed. The, the leaders were, dis, were executed. Uh, but by and large, the German people remained. But with, without that Nazi identity in place, and, and that, th they say that this, kind of like the Canaanite religions and so forth, that was the ultimate goal to remove that kind of religious identity. If they could, that could be removed, if they sided with the, the true people of God and identified with him like Rahab and uh, strangers in Joshua chapter eight did at the reading of the law and others, the Gibeonites even, that there was that opportunity to identify with the people of God, to abandon their previous identity. And uh, and so to, uh, to drive out the people was the primary goal, but if people stayed around, they could, it's potential for them to abandon their previous allegiances and to identify with the one uh, true God. And there, and, and so, but God was concerned about Israel's not losing its own identity in all of this. And so that's why you see a very severe command related to the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites. Otherwise the mission and identity of Israel itself could be corrupted. Thank you.